Hi, this is Ryan Ely. I'm the co-executive producer of Money Matters with Wes Moss every Sunday on WSB. And I also helped put together this book, You Can Retire Sooner Than You Think, by Wes Moss. If you've already read this book, you can leave us a review on Amazon. If you haven't read it, it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, pretty much anywhere books are sold. And this book, hopefully, I think and know, has helped tons of people retire sooner than they think. And I am here, believe it or not, after three years since this book's been released, to do a Q&A with the author, Wes Moss. Wes, oh, thank you for being here. Oh, we're panning in. Good afternoon. Thank you well, for having me. Thanks for being here. Yeah, being it's here. fun to be interviewed. Yeah, well, especially about your own project. Yes, yes. A passion and project, if you would. It is fun. It is a lot of fun. Well, good. Well, uh... Let me get started. Let me ask you this. This what? is my version of a movie. So I get to talk. The coolest thing about it, I always get envious of these movie guys and producers and the actors and the directors. They make one movie. It might take them a year. And then they talk about it for like a decade. I mean, that's like a really efficient way to do the world. You work for a year and then you're, you're talking about your work for like 10 straight years. It lives on. And it's a little bit like that with having a book. So it's fun. Well, good. Well, we're trailblazing. Let's see if we can make the book carry three. We'll work on ten after this. But, yeah, right. Uh, so we're at three now. We'll, uh -huh. we'll go for ten. Let me uh, well, let me ask you this, but really basically, what inspired you to write? You can retire sooner than you think. The um, I would say this. The f first of all, writing writing the books is this giant undertaking. It's a big task, and it is difficult to figure out anything that is new within retirement planning. That's 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 a real challenge. And I've always had this nagging feeling, uh, and I think it goes back to, I, I have this memento in my little little watch box. I keep my watch every morning in with a little fa the first Father's Day card that my now 10-year-old, so I've had this in there for 10 years, gave me, it was like the first Father's Day, it said, you know, Happy Father's Day, Dad, I love Ben. And I also keep this little ticket stub from the movie, uh, the pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. and the pursuit of happiness really hit home with me because uh, it was a it was a, it was this it was this this wonderful journey of someone who was in the investment business that was just trying to have a happy life. But then there was this theme about getting enough money to be able to get to be a place where his his family was in in a good position, and the the story. Chronicles, Will Smith um, played the character in the movie, and, he, the, his, and his son was five or six years old, and he was doing all the right things for, in his job, and ultimately he went out of, he, his company went out of business, he ended up not being able to pay his rent, ended up homeless in the streets of San Francisco. So, the really touching story that had everything to do with America and business in America, and the impact of money on a family. And then this pursuit of getting enough money to at least hit this kind of baseline happiness, if you will, to be able to do the things that, that, that any family wants to do in America. And it, it chronicles this so well. It's a very impactful movie for me. And every time, so I saved this movie ticket back, and I want to say it was 06. Mm -hmm. So this is 11, 11 years ago before the, uh, or maybe let's call it about 10 years ago. And I thought about it and thought about it, and for some reason, one morning, I thought to myself, there's this certain cadence, and this is as the financial crisis was kind of ending, there's this certain cadence of uh, the, the families that, that I work with uh, in, the, in, the, in the world of financial planning and investment advice that, taught, that, that, that spoke to me as this group of really... Uh, content or happy folks, meaning that they, they, they had this something in common that they had this comfort level with, the, the, with their financial world and how they used their money, and that, that they had this wonderful combination of being extremely happy or content. And I thought to myself, if I can try to bottle that up and capture these consumer habits, these, behavior, these behaviors of the happiest retirees. And at, a t at the time, there was this, uh, and I guess this was about 10 years ago, because the, the, the book um, 
Happiest Baby on the Block was pretty popular for new parents, and you're trying to get your kid to sleep through the night, you're reading this book, Happiest Baby on the Block. I remember a, wait, a, a waiter one time it, it, it knew that I, I had a kid and was like, oh, I just had a kid, you need to get this book, Happiest Baby on the Block. And uh, I thought to myself, why don't I do a book effectively that says Happiest Retiree on the Block? You know, what are the, what are the habits of these folks? So. In, in trying to figure out those habits in a, in a researched way, as opposed to just me coming up with, hey, I think that this family does this and this family does this, I ended up doing this big national survey to quantify what you thought might be these common traits. To some extent, right? So I asked all questions all around the areas we thought might, might come back. And, and again, this is something that uh, ended up being a story or a, ended up being a survey that we asked, I want to say, 50 different questions, and we ended up getting close to 1,500 responses in 46 different states. It, it became, came back to this giant set of data, where, pe where people shop, where they eat, where they, when they started saving, when, how much they have saved, how much income they have today versus how much was their highest income mm -hmm. throughout their life. And uh, we, we got this mountain of data back, and the other really important question was, are you happy? Or, well, how do you rate yourself on a happiness scale? Scale one to ten, like where are you in this continuum? That question turned out to be a giant part of this um, this this whole survey. And the the survey itself um, move more. Your notes. Oh, move my notes. Okay. So we're we're kind of it's Facebook Live. So we do a lot of Facebook we'll do it live. live. It's okay, we're live. You can you can producer Mallory, you can tell me what we need to do is we're Facebook Live. It's okay. Because we've got like people running around in the back and writing in Spanish on the board and trying to tell us what to do with translating. It's, it's okay, we're Facebook it Live. It's okay. Um so, <laughs> so we're there we're there for for the money side of things for people, for all these questions, for the data that came back. Was it money that made people happy? Was there a certain amount they had to have? How did that work? Yeah, so the, and again, this is, so we get th this mountain of data back. We ask folks all these habits, and then we ask them about their happiness, and we were able to take the happy group and then compare it to the unhappy group. And that's what turned out to be a huge part of this book. And, and as you know, Ryan, because you helped with the, cert this, the data, call it four years ago, when we really did this project, uh, to, to assemble all that data and quantify and compare all these different questions and then take the happy group and the unhappy group and, and compare their, their, their life habits, their financial habits, was a giant project. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and, and, and I, there was a point in time when you and I kind of looked at each other and said, oh my God, this is, this is cool. Because this is like, we, we, we know what kind of cars these people drive and what, what, what kind of- It was the car very first one, wasn't it? Well, it was the, the first cars. one I think the light bulb went off. It's yeah. like, wait a minute. Uh, the, the unhappy group drives this kind of car specifically, mm -hmm. yeah. and the happy group drives this kind of car. And, and because that was a free form answer, we didn't just say check a box, it was fill in the blank. Yep. So we took all that data, to, to, what are the two cars in your driveway, mm -hmm. husband, wife, or if you're single, the one car, if you have two cars. And I remember when we finally got that data back, we, we thought to ourselves, wow, this is cool. This is a really different way to say, Happy retirees, on average, they drive these three cars, mm -hmm. which was a pretty pretty phenomenal. And they and then the same thing came back with that. Where do you shop for clothes? Th these three main stores relative to the unhappy group. So we got all these really cool consumer habits that make the book very unique from a from a perspective of saying th th this type of financial habit and these consumer habits or behaviors are indicative of. Happy retirees. Do they cause you to be a happy retiree? I don't know the answer to that. It's just that this is what happy retirees do versus unhappy retirees. So your retire or your your client base inspires you to look harder at the data of what makes people happy versus unhappy. The data takes it a step further, and now all of a sudden you you have a real concept for a book. And I think at some point in everyone's life they, they think to themselves, I should write a book about this. I could write a book. Take me through the, the process of actually writing the book and, and that year or so long process of taking the idea, the data, and then executing and actually 
putting something together that's a full concept? How, how did that work personally and logistically? The, 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 uh, the, this, is a, this whole the process of the book is, is a giant undertaking. Um, and, and I would go back to one other thing, too, before I get to that, is that to your point, we, we, to some extent, we had this at least framework from real-life clients that said, hey, here are some of the things that you should explore. And then the data from the survey really backed it up. One of the, uh, the giant parts of this has to do with the core pursuit of the happy retiree that I, want, that I definitely want to get to when we talk about that. But the ho- what, what folks spend their time on, where they spend their money, and how they spend their money is also a big determinant of whether they're a happy or unhappy retiree. And we list this in the book. We call them core pursuits. The average happy retiree has close to four core pursuits. The average unhappy retiree has 1.9 core pursuits. In fact, I've even seen other articles write about that, uh, write about this, and it says, well, uh, it's accepted that the happy retirees have close to four or 3.9 core pursuits. I think that's from my book. So that's been that's been a, a cool part about the book writing process. On the downside, writing a book is a tremendous amount of time and energy and, and mental energy. And after I, for, it's, for a long time, I didn't write a, want to write a book because A, it's hard to come up with something new when it comes to money and retirement. B, I'd written a book several years prior that didn't really do well. It came out in 07, 08, right as the financial crisis was coming out. And the book was called Make More, Worry Less. And it wasn't my favorite book. I was kind of forced into it. And it came out when everyone was making less and worrying more. So it was like the worst title ever. And it didn't sell. And it was just kind of this giant project that took all this time that was dead on arrival. Mm-hmm. And it's just really frustrating to, to go through so much time. Just the fear of anybody who's going to write a book, right? And, and, it's, like a, and it's, a well, it's a well-founded fear. Because yeah. most, most books sell like 10 copies, uh-huh. which was about what my uh, second the book, second right? book really yeah. did. It was just like nobody bought it. So I, I, I thought to myself, I'm, and I, we, you and I had talked about this over the years, I'm, I said, I'm never doing another book. I'm not going to do it because it's too much work to have nobody care about it. And for, for a long time, uh, I worked with Andrea Risk for years as help with PR and media. And she, for years, said, you got to write a new book, you got to write a new book. But it wasn't until this eureka moment about happiest baby on the block, happiest retiree on the mm-hmm. block, hey, let's do a survey. The survey comes back. The survey's amazing. Now we've got a book. Now we've got something cool to write about. And that's what Retire Sooner Than You, you Can Retire Sooner Than You Think is all about. But I, I remember the survey, let's say, took uh, a month to come up with. It took a month to do. And then it took another month to, 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 to figure out what the survey data really told us. Mm-hmm. So that took about, a, about three to four months. And then it took another close to a year to write it and edit it and do all the things to make it ready to print. I remember being in the middle of, um, towards the end, I guess it was 2013, being in, in Christmas time during the winter, mm-hmm. having bronchitis and being on, like, you get steroids from your doctor to get rid of the I remember being on prednisone, <laughs> I think it was, which is like the war. I, I can't stand, it gives you this terrible feeling of like you're all anxious and you're amped and, up and yeah. you're sweating like probably like I'm doing now. It's like you drank seven Coca-Colas and you're sweating and you just feel disgusting, but you're super awake. And I remember for like three straight days standing at my kitchen island typing uh, and, and, and doing the final run through of the entire book. And I did it for, my kids are like, all you ever do, dad, is just sit there and write on your books. You know, that's all you ever do. But that's what they say if I do anything. So. You had, what, three berating you then? I think I, we know. At the time, we only had two kids. So yeah. to, uh, today, uh, no, I think Jake was probably one. He's five. So, yeah, no, Jake was one. So I had three kids at the time. So at least he didn't know any different at the time. He, did, he had no idea. He had no idea, just the other So kid. Ben and Luke, and they still berate me today for pretty much everything. So Okay. Well, uh, uh, the, the, the other thought is that, um, you know, when you're writing a book, one of my business partners here, uh, Mike Reiner, he gave me a lot because he knew. I think he knew the first book I wrote. He had like you know sold four copies, but he, he forever he was like nobody's gonna buy your book. Uh, it's gonna be dead on arrival like the last book. It's you're gonna you're spending all this time, Wes. Every night I see you in your on the weekends. You're, 
it, nobody's gonna ever buy the book. And then at the end, you know, so we've 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 sold sold close to a hundred thousand copies wow. now, which is very different than four, like we sold through Make More Worry Less, and it's been such. I I think it's just because we have so much. I have so much passion behind doing it, and I know that it helps people. I know it's a unique idea. I've had so many conversations in the last three years from folks that the book has helped and it's opened their eyes to the fact that hey wait maybe i don't need five million dollars to retire that's the other thing that i think is so uh important about this is that so much about money goes back to wall street scaring you into saying i don't think you have enough money I and mean, if you ask a financial if you ask a barber if you need a haircut he's going to say you need a haircut if you ask your retirement planner if you need to save more money, he's going to say, "Yeah, you got to save more money." Uh -huh. And um, the the what I found in this book, and I think what's really helped people, is to say, "Look, you don't need ten million dollars to retire. You don't need five million dollars to, to to retire. You have to have five what I think very specific checkpoints. That's the the money five money secrets. Are they secrets? No. I mean, we'll go through right now if we want." The, the, the publisher said make them secrets. They are good fundamental checkpoints we all need to get to. Mm -hmm. You need to get to them. I need to get to them. If you're watching here on Facebook Live, by the way, Facebook Live, hello, uh, on all medias here, uh, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, uh, the, the, you have to have some sort of checkpoints we can all work towards, and that's what is so helpful for mm -hmm. people in this book. I just read a review this week where folks said uh, Wall Street kind of scares you into thinking it, it's never enough. You never have enough money to retire. Mm -hmm. But this book unlocks the, the, the thought that, hey, I, I can do this. I don't have to work till I'm 70. I can stop working at 55 or 62, whatever that number is, as long as I hit these checkpoints. The other part about this is that, we, I, I, and I want to encourage folks, getting into um, it's, it's never too late to start mm -hmm. so just because you're 50 and you haven't totally done all the right moves in retirement and you feel like you're behind and most people feel like they're behind mm -hmm. so America is behind I mean you, you're you're in the investment business we see it all the time well and that no one knows no one has the data set like the book does to tell them where they stand right there isn't really a guide path of an honest one Hey, who do you, of, what do you have versus what, what what other people have, and what do you have in relation to what do you want to do? You know that no one really thinks about it that way, right? It's kind of a you, you squirrel money away when you can, you get your kids through college, and then yeah, you get to about fifty, and, and then you, you and you usually feel like you're behind. Yes. And if you have five hundred thousand dollars, you feel like you need a million. If you have a million dollars, you feel like you need two, two million. million. And yeah. you always feel behind, and that's maybe that's just psychologically we we feel that way because we're trying to give ourselves a real cushion and maybe it's that the messaging from wall street for a hundred years has been you don't have enough money you need more you need more you need more so in in that light for you with four kids now that's a and lot of knowing kids. the five secrets to the happiest retirees are you en route to being one yourself are you following the five well, secrets well what one of the big parts of the book it takes up a lot of the first almost the first half of the book has to do with core pursuits and what we're spending our money on in America. And again, I, I alluded to the fact that the happy retirees have 3.9 core pursuits, unhappy retirees have, or 3.6 core pursuits, unhappy retirees have uh, 1.9. So less than two, two and almost four. Mm -hmm. um, they also have another chapter in the book has to do with multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. It should you shouldn't just rely on your investments. You can't you don't want to just rely on social security. You want to rely on multiple streams of income, and one of those streams of income ha has to do. One of them is just part time work, or continuing to work with something that you're really passionate about. And one of the, one of the things that I think it's unfortunate that I see all the time is folks will come in here after 35 years of a job in the same industry, and they're just have zero passion left for it. They don't, they have no love for it. Mm -hmm. They would love, they, they were out the door five years ago, but they're still working. And it's so important for, for families to find something that they've got a passion for. 
and that could be it could be after their main career and it could be part of part-time work and then for five years they go work at Home Depot because they love they love home improvement and they're there and it's it's literally a fun job for them they might work at a, at a Bass Pro Shop because they love outdoors they might uh, work at a golf course because they love the game of golf mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know it's so for me I'm lucky to be in the career where I'm, I'm doing something that I'm completely passionate about. I mean, mm -hmm. this is, I've been in the financial industry for almost 20 years, but being able to write about and identify, do research on and then write about this and help families in real life, to me, is just, I'm very fortunate to be in a position where I, I just love doing it. I, I, so to me, it's not work. And uh, to me, being a happy retiree is doing some, not stopping working as much as it is finding something that you just love to do. For a lot of folks, it doesn't necessarily pay the bills as well as a consulting job where you're traveling all over the country. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of folks, enable getting yourself to a point where you are working, uh, you might not be earning nearly as much money, but if you're doing something you love and you're passionate about, then mm -hmm. you're you're by definition you're going to be a happy retiree. So for me, I don't know. Uh, I I think that just loving my industry and the work that that I get to do, we we get to do on radio every week with WSP Radio. We're in a fortunate position that I think I'm. I think I'm. I feel like sometimes I feel like I'm retired already. My kids would not say that. You know, my kids would say you're not retired. Why don't you just work out of the house then, Wes? Because we're going to be playing lacrosse and football every five minutes outside. Um, so I still have to do... Well, harder is, to get there anything is, done. There is real work to be done in the industry that I'm in, but it is a lot of fun. So one of the big parts about becoming a happy retiree um, in the book is obviously income investing. And becoming an income investor and learning what that means. Why are you so obsessed or passionate about income investing? Why do you believe in it so much? The... Again, investing is so, uh, there's so many paths to doing it right. There's a lot of paths to doing it wrong. I w was fortunate enough to interview uh, Carrie Schwab Pomerantz this week, daughter of Charles Schwab, and she made a great point that investing is about participation. Mm -hmm. It's not about doing it perfectly. It's not about getting it right every step of the way. It's about just being part of, just participating, whether you're in your 20s or your 30s or your 40s, just doing it. And I, the reason I, am, I, I love income investing so much is that it's, such, it's one of the few ways that I've seen investors just, the light bulb goes on when they understand, well, here, income investing is just a philosophy that's easy to understand. I want everything that I own from a stock perspective to pay me a monthly or a quarterly dividend. I want everything from the bond side to pay me a monthly dividend or interest payment. So if I have this steady income stream, I can wrap my arms around that. And, and you know what, Wes, this allows me to participate, which makes me a better investor. And to be able to bring that to families and then also have the income in a portfolio fulfill the spending need on top of part-time work or Social Security, maybe you have a pension, that's what we do at my firm, outside of writing a book, outside of radio. And, and that is an awesome, that's an awesome discovery, if you will. So is it fair to say then that Income investing and the way you talk about retirement in the book is more about retirement, not as I get to a day and I stop working, but more of like a, a timeline of income streams and figuring out where they it, come from. It, it is. It really is about. So it's kind of. It, it, I call this retirement gray zone. So it's it's we don't it, we very uh, infrequently work to sixty five and then we just stop and then we're retired. It's not black and white. It is. Well, for most of us, particularly early retirees, folks that want to retire in their early 60s or in their 50s or even their 40s, usually it's a progression. It's I'm going to slow down doing this pro profession and I'm going to start doing something else or something different or spending less time working, more time traveling, more time having fun while I wait for my different income sources to kick in. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a pension, whether I wait to withdraw from my assets or not. So it's really, the, it is a timeline that you may take anywhere from a year to 10 years before we go from fully working to fully not working. And we talk about that uh, a lot in, in, uh, on my website, uh, westmoss.com. I, I recently wrote an article uh, 
called the Retirement Gray Zone that talks just about this. But, but it, came, it initially came up in the book uh, talking about when these different income streams kick in. And a really important one is the one that you control after you stop working, and that's your the investments that you have. And they've got to produce a steady monthly paycheck for your family. So uh, one of the things that you see on a lot of the commentary around the book uh, is uh, a lot of people saying that some of the things in the book don't apply to the average American. Oh, this is crazy. Yes. I couldn't even get to the minimum threshold. Who could? Right. What advice do you have for those people, and why should they still read the book? What, what can they glean from the advice in there if they just feel like they're too far behind the age? Yeah, nobody said it's easy. You know, it's, um, I, I feel like I'm reciting Coldplay lyrics. You know, nobody said it was easy. Nobody uh, said it would be this hard. The, the, yeah, the uh, going back to the start. Is that what? It, see, you're like a photographic memory with lyrics. The, <laughs> so, but that that's the, the reality here is that it was all yellow. <laughs> I think that's a different song, actually. I think it is. Yeah. Um, but the reality here is that retirement planning for most Americans isn't even an option because they, there is no retirement to plan because they have no savings, and. You know, some of the com I've gotten a couple hun several hundred comments on the book. I I'd encourage folks to go read the comments, decide for yourself. If um, the link is in the description to this video, to is do it so really? at That's Amazon. So fancy. You are um, Yes, we're going to add the link in the description to add a review. I think you should add a review. I think <laughs> everyone should add a review. Everyone should do a review on the book. Thanks, Mallory. Um, with that, so. Um, so I, no, I go back to the, the part. It's not the, easy, right? Forever. You get a lot of folks that, that think one is the book. But you also have some people that are like, "Hey, Wes, this author thinks it's easy. Thinks everybody can get to five hundred thousand in in liquid assets at some point in order to retire. That's impossible for me." Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? It is for a lot of people. You know, it, uh, there's a reason that. I start the book out with a couple of statistics, and the, the uh, I think it's the ERBI, the Employee Benefits Research Institute, EBRI. Mm -hmm. Every year comes out with this giant study about the state of finances in America, and and if you look into the statistics, you're going to see this is where you hear you know sixty seventy one percent of Americans age sixty uh, one and older, sixty three and older have thirty one grand saved total. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, it's a giant percentage of the population that, that just doesn't have the capacity to save. They didn't start. They didn't start until they never thought about it. They never thought they could do it. So this book, um, two things. One, it's not too late for most folks. So even if you're 50 and you and I even write about this in the book, the Pepper sort of the Pepper family, they didn't really have anything going until they're almost 50. They looked at each other across the table and said, "Look, we got 38 grand saved." And they're almost 50. They, they stepped it up. They really got focused. Mm -hmm. They had pretty good jobs. And they ended up with a little, about a $1.2 million by the time they retired. Not, an e not easy. They had good, pretty good incomes. But it, it is, it's a really... Um, I guess they had to kind of figure out participation, it sounds like. Again, like you mentioned earlier, for them, there was no participation up till 50. And then I'd imagine... Maximum participation. Yes, let's from catch there up. to let's play catch up. Yeah, yeah, they did. So, so I economic think, shutdown a part of that? Yeah, they basically said, look, every single thing, everything we make, our kids are out of college now. Everything we make, we're going to save. So we're going to save like sixty percent of all income. Taxes was thirty, fifty percent of savings, and I think that left them with like twenty percent left over to live on. So in that period um, of time when things were hard, they were focused on saving and and went from having no savings to quite a significant nest egg. But it wasn't like they're they were living high on the hog either for that no. decade plus of, no. of crunch. Time, it, it, it right? took so it, your point it about it not being easy. It yeah. took some discipline. So, um, is there um, as you're thinking oh, this through? Yeah, yeah, as I'm thinking this through. So uh, let me let me get to this question. So, are you three years removed from your last book thinking about writing another book? Oh, uh, what's next? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I would tell you that uh, producer Mallory that's here producing this today uh -huh. is, is, is hammering home, yes, you're doing another book. I, I would say this, just like I thought a long is time Andrea ago. Andrea back on the phone with this too? This time it, she's passed the baton She's Mallory. passed the baton. Okay. Uh, the, but the reality here is that I don't want to write a new book until there's something awesome to write about. 
I, I do, so I think that, I don't know if I can top, you can retire sooner than you think, mm -hmm. quite frankly. It's, just, it's the, the, the balance between the unhappy and happy retirees, the way it talks about utilizing your money for all the wonderful things we do in this world, core pursuits, um, it's going to be hard to top that, uh, I, in my opinion. I would like, would I like to follow up on that? Have we done another study that gives us some pretty amazing um, insight on happy retirees versus unhappy that we haven't written about before? The answer is yes. Wait till folks hear about the marriage chart and what, how many years it takes to be married, when happiness goes up or down relative to how many years you're married. That's spicy stuff. It's spicy. Uh, we asked about what, uh, what news channels people watch. So, do happy retirees watch CNN or do they watch CNBC? Or do they watch neither? Well, maybe they watch neither. What are the favorite entertainment channels for the happy retiree versus the unhappy retiree? Right? Do we solve the, do I pay off my mortgage question in the next book? I don't know. Maybe we do all that. But the answer here is that I think there's another really significant update to retire sooner than you think. It may be coming sooner than you might think to a theater near you. But, yeah, you know, it's, it's something. Uh, but, but again, to us, this has just been fun. You, you've been a big part of helping on the book, um, and it's helped a lot of folks. And we've probably, again, we've probably sold about 100,000 copies. I'd like, to do, I'd like to do another 100,000. Nothing in this book is old or stale at all. Uh, the, the market environment is similar to what it was in the book. The outlook on rising interest rates similar to when we wrote mm -hmm. the book. Mm -hmm.